Hi guys, welcome back to Mastering Python from Basics to Machine Learning. I really hope that you're enjoying the course so far and that you've started writing your own little programs. Today we're going to continue on with our series on data structures by looking at tuples. Now you might be wondering what exactly is a tuple or tuple as some people call it. Well, imagine you have a box where you can store all different items. But once you close it, that's it. You can't add anything new, you can't remove anything, you can't modify it. And that, in a nutshell, is a tuple in Python. It's a container for your data that stays fixed once it's been created. Why are tuples so useful and how do they differ from their cousins, the lists? When do you want to use a tuple instead of some of the other data structures? We'll cover everything from creating tuples to modifying the content. We'll look at some really cool tricks of stuff that you can do with them and more. So are you ready to unpack some tuples? Well, let's get started. All right, let's kick things off by exploring different ways to create tuples. It's just as easy as creating lists and pretty similar, actually. First up, we have the empty tuple. We create it with just a pair of parentheses. So here you can see empty tuple equal and then the parentheses. When we print it out, we get an empty tuple. Simple, right? Now we can also create the tuple with predefined elements, which is what we do most of the time. Here, for example, we have a tuple of fruit. We have apple, banana and cherry. And when we print it out, it prints our tuple. As opposed to list, you enclose your tuple with parentheses rather than square brackets. But in many cases, you can actually omit the parentheses. Here, for example, we define our colors red, green and blue without the parentheses. And when we print it, it still wraps it in a tuple. Both fruits and colors are valid tuples. Now here things get a little bit tricky. What if you want to create a tuple with just one element? Now you might think that you write your one element and put it in parentheses, but in that case Python would just interpret the parentheses as such. Now in order to create a single element tuple, you need to include a trailing comma, and this will let Python know that you're in fact creating a tuple. So here we have single fruits equal apple, comma, before we close the parentheses, and this gives us a tuple with just one element. That comma is really, really crucial. Without it, like I said, Python treats us as a regular value in parentheses and not a tuple. And last but not least, let's talk about the tuple constructor. Now the constructor is very handy when you're converting between different data structure types, which is something that you'll do a lot. It lets you create tuples from other iterable objects. Let's have a look at lists and strings. As you can see here, first we create a tuple from a list. When we print it out, it gives us the tuple. And then we create a tuple using the constructor from a string, hello. And as you can see, it splits it down in the individual letters and creates a tuple from it. Just like lists, tuples can also be unpacked. You'll find that you'll actually see a lot of similarities to lists throughout this video. Unpacking allows you to assign the elements of a tuple to individual variables. Let's have a look. So here we assign one to three to x, y, and z in one statement. When we print it out, our output says one to three. This is a pretty powerful feature because with one line of code, we were able to assign three values to three variables. It's clean, it's efficient, and it's very Python. Just remember to make sure that the number of variables matches the number of elements in your tuple. Otherwise, Python will raise an error. Now you might be wondering, what if I want to unpack only part of a tuple? Well, you can use the star syntax for tuples to catch the remaining elements. Let's look at an example. Here we have a tuple with elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we're unpacking it into first, and then star rest catches all the remaining elements. So when we print this out, first is 1, and rest outputs 2, 3, 4, 5. You should note that rest becomes a list rather than another tuple. So in this case, 2, 3, 4, 5 is encased in a list. But wait, there's more. So tuple unpacking has practical applications that can make your code more readable and more efficient. For example, it's great for swapping variables without the need for temporary variables. In this case, we have a, b equal to five and 10. And with a simple statement, a comma b equals b comma a, we can swap the values around. And here's another real world scenario with tuple unpacking. Imagine you're working with coordinates. We have a point, three, four, we can unpack this point to the coordinates x and y and then print it out afterwards. See how easy it is to work with structured data? Accessing tuple elements works the same way as it does with lists. We have indexing and slicing. We can access an element by using square bracket notation, giving the index of the element that we want. Here, for example, we have my tuple is apple, banana, cherry, and we want to access apple, so we go print my tuple and then brackets zero. If we want the second element, we go my tuple one. 
We can also use negative indexing as we've seen before. If we want the last element, we go my tuple minus one or the second to last my tuple minus two. Just remember that Python raises an index error if you're trying to access an element that doesn't exist. And that's why you should always make sure that the index is actually within the tuples range. For this, we can use the len function that gives us the length of the tuple. Here the script checks that the index is less than the length of the string, remember zero-based indexing, and if it is, it prints it. Taking this a step further, we can look at slicing. Now the syntax for slicing is really straightforward. Just like with lists, we have tuple and then in square brackets start, end and step. With start the starting index, end the last index which is excluded from the return statement, and the step indicating the step between individual elements. If you have a tuple of numbers 0 to 5 and we take a slice 1 to 4, we get 1 to 3, as you would expect. We can also use negative indices to slice from the end of the tuple. Here we're starting the slice at the third element from the end and slicing all the way to the end. If we want to reverse the order of the elements in a tuple, we can use the same trick that we learned with lists and go with a negative step. If this all seems a little bit daunting and a little bit fast, make sure to review the slicing part of the video about lists. There should be a link in the top right corner right now. Tuple slicing is a really powerful tool that can make your code more efficient and easier to read, and it's definitely a good technique that you want to have under your belt. So far I've talked about how similar tuples are to lists, but there's one major difference that we're going to look at now. Tuples are immutable. Now, this simply means that once you've created them, they cannot be changed. Unlike lists where we can add elements and modify at will, tuples cannot. So in this example, we define a tuple, one, two, three, we print it. And now if we try to change the value of the first element within the tuple, Python raises a type error. Now you might be wondering why you would want something that cannot change, and it's a great question, but immutability has some fantastic advantages as well. Now, first of all, it ensures data integrity. Once you create the tuple, you can trust that it will always stay that way. It also makes your data much more secure. You can share tuples without worrying about accidental modifications, which is especially important when you work on larger projects with other people. And in some cases, it can even boost performance. If you really need to change a tuple, there are some clever workarounds, as always. Let's look at two of these. If we want to change the first value of this tuple, we can make a new tuple and set it to a tuple with an element that we want to add, five in this case, concatenate it, so using the plus symbol, with the original tuple starting at index one. So we're essentially dropping the first element from the original tuple and we're concatenating it with the element that we want to add. Alternatively, we can convert the tuple to a list, change the value in the list, and then convert it back to a tuple. In both cases, we're creating a new tuple rather than modifying the original. Although tuples are immutable, they still have some methods that we can perform on them. We can count the number of elements in the tuple using the count method. This tells you how many elements appear in our tuple. In this case, the number two occurs three times. We can also find the position of an element using the index method. This will output one because that's the index of the first occurrence of two in our tuple. But as always, remember Python will raise a value error if the element cannot be found with the index function. Now it's over to you. Let's practice what we've learned. Here's a quick exercise for you. Create a tuple with the following elements, apple, banana, cherry, date, and cherry. Use the count method to find out how many times cherry appears in the tuple. Use the index method to find the position of the first cherry and then use the index method again to find the position of the second cherry. Print out the string that tells us about the positions of the two cherries. Pause the video, give it a try, and when you're done, we'll have a look at it together. Right, how did you do? Here's what your code might look like. We first define our tuple, my fruits, with apple, banana, cherry, date, and cherry, and closed in parentheses. And then we define three variables, number of cherries, first position, second position. And we do this by using the count method. So count cherries gives us the number of cherries, the index, which gives us the first occurrence. And then we're using index comma three, which means look for it starting from the third position onwards. And then finally, we use an F string to print the number of cherries and the position that we find them in. Now, if you got this right, great job. If you didn't, no worries. That's what learning is all about. 
We also have operations that we can perform on tuples, and these are the same as on lists. We have concatenation using the plus sign. We can create a new shopping list tuple by concatenating our fruit and vegetable tuples. When we run this, we get a new tuple with all our items, apple, banana, carrots, and potato. We can also repeat tuples using the asterisk operator, which copies the tuple a number of times. In this example, we've created a repeating pattern, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. I've been mentioning lists a lot up to this point, so let's take a closer look at the similarities and the differences between tuples and lists. You can think of tuples and lists a bit like siblings. They look similar, but they each have their own unique strengths. Tuples are generally faster than lists when it comes to reading operations. This is because tuples are immutable, which allows Python to optimize how it handles tuples. They also use less memory than lists, which makes them perfect for data that won't change. So when should you use tuples versus lists? As a rule of thumb, use tuples for data that shouldn't change, like the days of the week or the, the names of months. And you use lists when you need to add, remove or modify elements. And that's an easy rule of thumb to go by. Now imagine you're working on a project where you need to represent points in 2D space. You could of course use a regular tuple to represent these points, but wouldn't it be nice if we had a more descriptive way to access these values? For this, we can use a package called named tuples. In order to use this, we first need to import it from the collections module with from collections import named tuple. Let's have a quick look at the syntax of named tuples. To define a named tuple, we have to give it a type name, and then we have to define the field names, so the names of the individual elements within your tuple. Let's look at a practical example. We'll create our first tuple and call it point. So in this case, point equals named tuple, and then we give it the type name, so point, and then we define the names of the individual elements, X and Y. What we've done here is create a new type called point that has two fields, X and Y. To create a point using our new name tuple, we do this, P equals point three four. Now you can access the values using dot notation. We can go print P dot X and print P dot Y. Isn't that beautiful? Our code is now so much more readable and self-explanatory. Now let's put our newfound knowledge to the test with a quick exercise. Pause the video and try to create a name tuple called person with the fields name, age, and city. Then create an instant of the name tuple with your own information. Pause the video, have a go, and when you're done, press play again. Ready? How did that go? Here's what your solution might look like. So first we define our named tuple. We give it a name, person, and then we define the names of the elements within it, name, age, and city. Once we've defined the name tuple, we can create a new person. In this case, we're creating me, Gunnar49 Amsterdam. And once we've created me, we can print my details using the dot notation, so me.name or .age .city. Right, next, let's have a quick look at sorting tuples. First things first, let's create a tuple to work with. Now you might be thinking, how can we sort a tuple if it's immutable? And you would be right, but there's a little trick here. The sorted function actually returns a list. So we need to convert it back to a tuple. Instead of changing the original tuple, we've created a new one using the constructor via a list that was returned by sorted. We can, of course, also reverse the order using the reverse is true parameter. Great, with that sorted, let's look at tuple comprehension. Tuple comprehensions are like the, the cool, efficient cousin of list comprehensions. They're more memory friendly and they're perfect for handling large data sets. Let's break down the syntax. So we have an expression. These are the elements that we want to add to the tuple for items in iterable with an optional condition at the end. This looks just like list comprehension, right? But there's a little bit more to this than meets the eye. Unlike list comprehensions, which create a full list immediately, tuple comprehensions create something called a generator object. What this means is that they generate values on the fly, which saves memory and improves performance. Let me show you with a quick example. Here we start with the tuple numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we use tuple comprehension n squared for n in numbers, which we set to squared numbers. Now when we print square numbers, we don't get the tuple, but instead we get a generator object. In order to turn it into a tuple, we need to call the tuple constructor on the generator and save it into a variable. And there you go, we get 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, which is what we wanted. Right, your turn with one last exercise. Again, pause the video 
really have a go at this. Right, your task is to create a tuple comprehension that generates the cubes of even numbers from 0 to 10 and then convert it to a tuple and print the result in reverse order. Pause the video, think about it, and when you're done, press play and we'll look at the answer. Right, so the solution should look something like this. First, we create our tuple of cubes. We have n to the power 3 for n within range 11, so values 0 to 10 if n modulus 2 equal to 0. So this is all the even numbers. We can then use the sorted method on these cubes with reverse equal true and convert this list back to a tuple. And finally, we print the reversed cubes list. And last but not least, we'll have a quick look at the zip function. Imagine you have two tuples, one with names and another one with ages. Using the zip functions, you got tuples pairing each name with its corresponding age. Now zip also creates a generator object, and if you need the actual list of tuples, just wrap it in a list constructor. The zip function is also very useful when you want to iterate over your lists. So imagine we have two lists, one for fruits and one for their prices. We can use the zip function to combine the two into our list of tuples as before, and then unpack them again into fruit and prices for our for loop. And then within our for loop, we can access both fruits and prices at the same time. And there you have it, tuples, an amazing data structure that's very memory efficient and fast to use. Hopefully you will have appreciated the nuances between tuples and lists and how to use them and when to use them. Next time, we're going to look at sets and then dictionaries to complete our series on data structures. Before you go, as always, give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, consider subscribing, and until next time, happy coding.